I'll begin today by touching on that topic myself before we move on to today's regional metrics update and a few other items. We all want our kids to be able to play sports. We all want our kids attending in person at school. And we all wish that this pandemic were over. But unfortunately, until we're able to make that third wish come true, our ability to make progress on the first two is somewhat limited. As schools and school teams have come back together this month, many sports have made adjustments to keep kids safe so that they can play with a lower likelihood of transmitting the disease. Some sports like youth football are more difficult and offer a higher likelihood of transmission. Over the summer, we saw outbreaks across Illinois and the world tied to a variety of youth sports leagues. Those continue today, even among the lowest risk youth sports. We have watched professional sports and even some college teams play seemingly without many problems. But remember that these programs are operating with daily testing or in a league created bubble or with facilities that allow for outsized social distancing and are sanitized every day. And in some cases, all of those precautions have been taken. That's not what's available to the vast majority of young people who play sports in Illinois. We've seen outbreaks here that have infected dozens of players, coaches, and family members, including one just last week in Wayne County, where nearly 100 players have been quarantined, and so far 37 have tested positive. Look, I'm not a scientist, but I do know how to listen to the experts and follow the latest data. I've always promised to do that, and I've always promised to be transparent about that, and I always will do that, no matter the political pressure. Under no circumstances will I put children and their families at risk. To those claiming that putting your child in danger is about personal choice, I say this is a pandemic. This is a terrible and unprecedented moment in our country. Living together in a free society means neighbors protecting each other so that we can all enjoy freedom and safety. This deadly virus should remind us that there are some individual choices that have enormous life-changing impact on others. While parents might choose to send their children out onto the playing field, I can tell you that someone else who becomes ill because of that decision wouldn't call that your personal choice. I want our kids back on the playing field or on the ice as much as anyone. And we'll get there when the doctors say it's safe. Until then, let's focus on keeping our schools and our businesses open and on keeping everyone safe. Let's be kind to one another too. In a few moments, I'll ask Dr. Lin to speak further on this topic I'm Mike Lin, infectious disease specialist from Rush University Medical Center. I study how diseases like COVID-19 spread. I've seen firsthand the suffering such diseases can bring, and I take care of patients who have had the misfortune of developing life-threatening COVID-19 illness. I'm also a lucky father of two kids, ages eight and 11, who love to play sports. This topic is deeply personal to me. The governor has asked me to comment about the science behind why high school football and other youth contact sports should be postponed this fall. Here's what the science tells us. COVID-19 is a deadly illness that spreads from person to person through close contact. Contact team sports, such as football and hockey, can become super spreading events very easily. Just one youth athlete showing up with the virus can start a chain reaction of spread that can quickly threaten an entire team. While the virus continues to circulate widely in our communities, there's no practical way to prevent outbreaks from happening in sports such as football with all the contact that's inherent in the sport. This is not just theoretical. We've seen COVID-19 outbreaks in college and professional sports teams that have much more prevention resources at their disposal. 
While contact sport itself provides an easy way on the field for the virus to spread, it is also incredibly important to remember that there are many off the field activities that are associated with contact sports, such as athletes using locker rooms, working out in gyms, and traveling together that provide a perfect storm of conditions to enable the virus to spread quickly. We are all in this fight to halt the spread of the virus and prevention steps such as postponing contact sports, as hard as it may be seeming on our children, will reduce infections and save lives. With every youth athlete, there is a parent or maybe a sibling or a grandparent who may be at risk for terrible outcomes from COVID-19 disease. Youth sports do not operate in a vacuum, and if COVID-19 spreads among our young athletes, it becomes a risk for our entire community. I wanna thank Governor Pritzker, Dr. Azike, and Illinois Department of Public Health for following the science and making difficult decisions that will save lives. They need all of our support during this still raging pandemic. But Governor and our public health officials can only do so much themselves. Each of us must play a part in prevention. With prevention, it's hard sometimes to appreciate the results because we never really know exactly whose life we've saved. But the numbers do tell a story, and we have learned that in the past eight months, that when we as a community are able to follow prevention steps, such as wearing a face mask, washing our hands, and social distancing, the number of COVID-19 infections do come down and we save lives. These prevention steps can be challenging and families should find ways to address their children's mental well-being, including getting plenty of time outside, taking walks, and connecting with mental health experts as necessary. I'll close by saying what I told my son who was really looking forward to playing contact sports this school year. Each of the things that we do to prevent COVID-19 in others, some small like putting on a face mask, others more significant like changing how we play and how we work, is an act of love and sacrifice to our fellow human beings. And this pandemic will not last forever. At some point with better medical advances, particularly with our hope for effective vaccines, this pandemic will end. But the time to relax is not now, especially as we head into the fall and winter season with so many lives at risk. You could probably find an expert to take a position any which direction that you want, that is true. But I also would say that Dr. Lin is not alone. Indeed, he is among the vast majority of uh, infectious disease experts, epidemiologists, scientists, et cetera, who are deeply concerned, particularly about contact sports, where there is uh, an exchange of sweat, saliva, other things that are going on on the field. Uh, on a regular basis, not to mention that there's very little protection when, once they're in the locker room. Uh, in the typical locker room, there, there's not that much social distancing, as you know. Um, there are concerns about that in addition to the field play. Um, there are obviously other sports that have locker rooms, but I'm just suggesting to you that all of the precautions that are being taken uh, by professional sports and by now by college sports are not available to people who play high school or junior high school sports. And I think the doctors have essentially said, look, we wanna get there as fast as we can, but now is not the time, especially as we're entering the flu season especially as we're entering a season where I think everybody is deeply concerned about a second wave hitting the United States. Uh, Dana. Governor Pritzker, I have to, I don't know if the facts are getting away here, but I'm going to have to tell you facts, just because I'm a high school coach. Over the An summer, opinion, I know, is what you're going to offer. Yeah. Over the summer, we had 536 football teams in Illinois had a summer camp. Mm -hmm. Over the summer, we had 536 football teams in Illinois had a summer camp. Well, I think, well, if you, I know, and it's, it's devastating. No, I'm not. Walk outside the door. <laughs> we take risks every set, a Friday on the football field, and we just want to have a chance.
choice. Yep. I don't want the government choosing if my son can play football. I'll make that decision. I understand, and I can appreciate the reaction that you have to it, um, and I do. And I know that there are many, many parents and, and kids who would like to be out on the field. Um, and I want them to be out on the field. And as you've seen, uh, sports have been categorized, not by me, by experts, about whether they're high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Um, and I'm simply following the science that's been provided. Now, I understand there are other states that have made different decisions. That's one of the tragedies of not having a national strategy here uh, or, or being led by a president or a CDC that you could trust uh, that's providing some direction for everybody. But what I can tell you is that one of the reasons that Illinois has the lowest positivity rate among all of our neighboring states is because we've been very careful, because we've listened to the scientists. We have some of the best scientists and doctors in the entire country in the state of Illinois. I've been relying upon that, not to mention Dr. Fauci and others. Um, and these are very difficult decisions, and they are emotional decisions even for me. Um, and I, all I can say to you is that as the information uh, uh, reveals itself, as the scientists come forward with new information, I just want to remind you all that at the very beginning, the CDC said, well, if you can't wear an N95 mask, don't bother wearing a mask. That was something they said at the very beginning. Um, we obviously have all discovered that that science has changed. We have studies now that show that even the cloth mask that you have on now is a benefit to everybody if we would all wear one or a, or a surgical mask as you're wearing, Craig. Um, so this is evolving. There's no doubt about it. And there have been changes. And there was a, not an understanding over the summer that that uh, when we would allow people to go to sports camps um, or join their leagues over the summer, um, there was not an understanding at the beginning of, of what the transmission might be that occurs. Uh, but the fact is that all over the world, youth sports have proven to be very problematic. And that I think is why, and I'm not making a political judgment about that, I'm just reading, as I think all of you can, about what other countries, what other states, what other... I understand everybody can make a choice here. There's no doubt about it, and I and Illinois is making a choice here. We're making a choice based upon the science that there are some sports that are less risky than others, and we're allowing those. Yes, so ma'am. Um, what threshold would you would need to be met where you would be comfortable allowing high school football this fall? Specifically, do you have a threshold? You mean a threshold in what way? A positivity rate, or you mean? Any, any other yeah. That is not what I'm being told by the doctors. There, there is not a positivity level that they're labeling for me that, it, well, at this level, it's safe. So then let's the, the, the virus, by the way, even when you get your, just so you know, no matter what your positivity level is, the virus is still out there. It's just a question of can you keep yourself safe? Are you wearing the right protective gear? Can you wear the right protective gear? For example, just one more thing, the idea that you know bars and restaurants can be just fully loaded at, capacity, at their original capacity, I think we've all determined that while this virus is going on, while we don't have an effective treatment or a vaccine, that doing that is literally creating super spreader events. So I, you know I, that's an example of some things that you just can't, there isn't a positivity level at which you would say, well, that's okay now. It's really about can we mitigate the effect of the virus by having some kind of vaccine or, or treatment. Well, then let me, so then let me rephrase the question. Sure. Is there, um, since there is no specific threshold um, that you would then allow high school football to be doing, um, is there, uh, and what factors other than, if any, other than a May I, if I appreciate your question, and I know where you're going, and I guess I would say I have two doctors behind me. I, I am listening to them and to literally some of the nation's, you know, most important experts on these topics. So if I may, to help answer your question, because that's where I'm going to find answers, is among the experts. I would like to call um, Dr. Ezeke to help answer the question, you know, what are the factors that might lead one to allow a sport to be uh, played in a competitive fashion, so. Well, and just, and, and yes, no, I appreciate yeah. that, but just so, because I, I yeah. think what I'm looking for is do you have a reopening plan, right? 
they yes. have, um, and that has some specific guidelines to allow for certain stages of reopening. Yes. So what I'm asking is, is there something regarding specifically high school football, because that's top of mind for so many right now, that would allow or that would prompt the state to say, okay, let's go ahead and allow it because we've met this, this, and this. Right. So again, we are trying to follow also, we do take advantage of the fact that you know, you learn from what's happening around the world and around other states. And so as we have, you all know, we've taken uh, more strict uh, stances and that has gotten us to where we are. So as we get lower and lower positivity rates, as we have less community spread, as we learn more about what the effects are in children, you know, we're still dealing with the Miss C, uh, that side effect, that very serious side effect that happens in children. We are seeing what's happening with you know, myocarditis, cardiac abnormalities in children who can get the virus. So as we get all of that information and as we can try to identify ways that we might be able to treat or prevent some of those serious complications, as we see what thresholds for positivity might decrease the risk enough uh, for sports to happen, high-risk sports. You know, we're going to be assembling all of that information using what's happening in, in, other, in other settings as well to try to make the most informed decisions. You know, I am working with IHSA. We are trying to see, we all want the same thing, I feel. Like, we don't want to pit anybody against each other. Nobody wants kids to sit on the sidelines. Nobody wants kids to not be in school. Everybody wants the same the same endpoint, and we're trying to just get there uh, in the safest way possible. And rest assured that we are working to see how we can get there. Um, we want to find a route to get there. Uh, we want to do it as safely as possible, minimizing the numbers of lives that will be lost as a result of some of these very consequential uh, decisions. And, and if I may say, I'm sorry, Dana, um, if I may just add that, look, decisions uh, are being made state by state, as you know. Um, and, I, and we've seen bad decisions getting made um, that have led to significant health consequences, right? I mean, we saw what happened in Florida and Texas and Arizona, right, when essentially no mitigation or very few mitigations were put in place. And then you had massive amounts of death. Indeed, they're still going on in the hundreds um, in some of those states or collectively in those three states. Um, and so we're trying very hard to make decisions that balance the interests of, like we've talked about, for example, health and safety as the number one consideration. A secondary consideration, of course, is our economy. We talk a lot about that, right? I mean, uh, uh, just sort of at the same level as the economy, we're also um, concerned to make sure that people have in-person education, putting sports aside just for a moment. We want people to be able to go to school. Um, and so we're, we're working on all of these things because all of us want the same results. It's just that we want to do it with a varying degree, apparently state to state, of how much health risk are you willing to take for the people of your state. Uh, you know, I just don't think that this is a uh, something that we should allow right now because it's dangerous. But do you understand yeah. the mixed message? Do you understand the mixed message of today <laughs> with the Big Ten, <laughs> the president of Northwestern, in fact, just saying moments ago, the medical advice changes, <laughs> the facts change, <laughs> and our minds change. That's true. And as I say, as I said earlier, um, we've learned so much along the way here. But you know, when you're talking about Big Ten and you're talking about professional sports, right? Much different than high school sports. It just is because of the amount of testing, because of the amount of uh, the doctors that are available, because of the focus on testing for myocarditis. That's something that the Big Ten has said that they will do uh, in kids who uh, contract coronavirus. That's not something that's happening at the high school level. And so we really need to just pay attention here to the different levels. It's not football is the same as foot, football here is the same as football over there. Um, if you could put a bubble around each one of these teams, for example, at high schools, uh, and you could provide the same kinds of services, perhaps high schools could do that. But look, I'm making decisions for an entire state. We have 855 school districts in the state of Illinois, and we have individual schools within those school districts, uh, more than 4,000 total schools. And you know, these decisions are, are they're difficult to make, um, uh, but th it's important that I keep in mind anyway how we can best keep our, our kids safe and healthy. I'm just